Good morning and welcome to worship at Peace Presbyterian Church. I'm Heidi Vardaman, the pastor of the church, and I'm here in this large sanctuary um, with only two other people. We have Patrice, our musician, and Katrina, our seminarian intern, who is serving as our liturgist today. If you do not have a copy of the service bulletin, if you did not receive a hard copy of it, um, as many of us did, um, you can go to an email that was sent to you very recently, just in the last few minutes, that has a less than perfect, but it still has a copy of the bulletin there. Uh, so if you if you have not received the uh, bulletin yet, if you don't have it, you might want to log off and then log back on by way of that bulletin. Oh, thank you. I welcome you to worship today, and we will begin our worship service with our gathering song, which is Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. And the joke is, you're going to be expected to learn the words. our master technician, Katrina Bergman, now serving as a pastor and liturgist. Welcome everyone, and please join me in our call to worship, which is Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountain of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Let us join together and worship God. And with that, we go to blessed holy name. Okay. Thank you. 
confession is this. We were yet sinners, and the proof of God's amazing love is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. And please join me as we speak our confession of sin. God, we come before you with rebellious, rebellious people. We, we have not fulfilled your intentions, your intentions for us. us. We, we have, have preferred our way to Christ's to way. We, we have, have disobeyed your commandments. commandments and, and we, we have, have worshipped ourselves and the things we have made. Forgive us. Restore in us the knowledge of who we are and make us alive to serve you in faith, obedience, and joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And hear the promises of God. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. God is faithful and just, and when we confess our sins, he will forgive them. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. become new people all together. The past is finished and gone. We have become fresh and new. And now, as new and forgiven people, let us greet one another in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. There's Francis. There's a with you I'm North. John. Oh, Francis and Diane both. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I see some. There, Atlanta's here. Yes, Atlanta's here. <laughs> we did have our first, we attempted to have our very first bring your own food picnic last Wednesday, the 12th of August. But just after we had set up, after we put out the tablecloths, there was a downpour. And not only one downpour, but then it rained yet again. So, friends, we were not able to accomplish it at that time, but we will persist and plan something in the future. Our church's week remains standard that we will be having a get together on Zoom at uh, 1030 on Tuesday morning and a Bible study at 1030 on Thursday morning. So even though we can't be together in physical sense, we are together spiritually and virtually. And you are, everyone is welcome to join us. Let us then continue our worship of God with, in Christ there is no East or West. Oh, my God, this is so 
our scripture for this morning as continues. We continue along the book of Matthew. This is Matthew in the 15th chapter, and we begin with the 21st verse. Let us open our hearts and listen for the word of God. Just left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And she answered, This is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And he said, Yes, Lord. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. May God bless to our understanding on our faithful response. This, God's holy word. Amen. I'm going to start in an old-fashioned way, which I'm going to hold up a picture for you like a Sunday school teacher, because this is a picture of the two, of all the characters in our story, among the most important. Of course, the one in the middle with the halo is Jesus himself, but next to her kneeling is the Canaanite woman. Behind Jesus are the disciples who've been complaining about the woman, saying she was driving them crazy and kept shouting at her. But the main part of the story is between Jesus and the Canaanite woman. Two characters, Jesus, Ben Joseph, the son of God, our savior and master, the rabbi, and the other character, a woman described as a Canaanite woman which means that she was among the indigenous people of uh, the Holy Land that the Hebrews had conquered and taken off, taken taken over. It's not a term that was usually used uh, at that time, but it clearly indicates that she was a non-Jew, a woman, a nobody. The problem in telling this story says Mark Davis in his website, Left Behind and Loving It. He says, the challenge of this story is it presents Jesus in an unflattering light. And good boys and girls throughout Christendom have been taught never to consider Jesus in a non-flattering light. Some of those good boys and girls have grown up into biblical commentators and still will not accept the starkness of this story insisting that Jesus is merely testing this desperate woman's faith. Commentators are constantly trying to uh, explain this away, that Jesus didn't make a mistake. He didn't blow her off. He didn't call her a dog, but the scriptures say he did. Now, remember, even Jesus could have a bad day. I mean, remember, we've been preaching through that. We've been following through the Gospel of Matthew. He has uh, fed the 5,000. Then he was exhausted. Last week, we heard about how he tried to go away and get some time by himself. And yet he was called to walk on the water. He was, in fact, it's possible that he walked on the water trying to avoid his disciples. But when he heard that they were having trouble with the wind and the storm, he went and help them. Jesus was exhausted. And it's possible 
and and right before this passage there's some teachings that jesus talks about what is clean and what is unclean jesus in that part rejects traditional understandings of what is clean and unclean in jewish law in traditional dietary practice in fact he says it's not what goes into the mouth that determines what is clean and unclean it is what comes out of the mouth that determines whether it is clean or unclean. They try to explain it away because, um, well, I think the story, the truth of the story is that even Jesus should not be bound by tradition, but instead he is bound by the law of love. For indeed, for Jesus, religious purity and faithful discipleship are not measured by perfect attendance badges one earns at Sunday school or worship or how often one has read the Bible from cover to cover or how much money one contributes to the church treasury. Purity and faithfulness are shown ultimately by how the church speaks and lives out the radical gospel of hospitality of Jesus Christ. Two characters are before us, the Canaanite woman and Jesus Christ. Within earshot of Jesus' teaching about what is clean and unclean comes an unclean woman who challenges him. It's this is not a miracle story. It is an argument. And what is shocking about this story is that Jesus loses the argument. She is one of only two people in the Gospel of Matthew who is described as having great faith. And the other one is the centurion, the Roman, in Matthew 8. The only two Gentiles explicitly receiving healing from Jesus. This woman has a daughter who has been tormented by a demon. And she has been shouting, crying out. He cry, she cried out to Jesus, son of David. I mean, how, how did she, as a Canaanite woman, even know the term that the Jews would be using to refer to Jesus as the Messiah? She'd done her homework, I guess. She knew how to address him. She cried out, Jesus, Master, Son of David, my daughter is tormented, tormented by an evil demon. And Jesus ignores her. So she goes to the disciples and they turn her away and they complain to Jesus and says, she is bothering us. Would you please take care of her? Um, in Peterson's translation, he says, she is driving us crazy. Mark Davis describes her as squawking. Certainly, she is demonstrating persistence. The woman is undeterred by indifference and the disciples' rejection. So Jesus says, listen, I am here for the lost ones of Israel, not for, uh, well, it's not fair, he says, to throw food to the dogs. And the woman yet is undeterred. She said, even dogs eat the crumbs from under the table. It is not right to take bread from the table and give it to the dogs. But that third time she insists, she is undeterred. Nevertheless, she persisted. And she said, even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. In Jewish tradition, a dog is a scavenger, unwelcomed, a persistent pest. It was an animal not easily scared away. 
In fact, the fact that she makes reference to a dog under a table shows how much she was not a Jew. It may be the case that in the Hellenistic world, the non-Jews may have kept some dogs as pets. And so she knew that that might be the way it goes. When our grandson is with us, suddenly all the dogs in our household come to the dinner table because he loves to sort of put some dog food, some food and just happen to fall on the ground and the dogs are very happy about it. In this story, there is a role reversal. The teacher is taught by the most unlikely of students, a foreign idol worshiping woman. This, well, this is a consistent with the gospel themes of role reversal. The first shall be last, the last shall be first, the master should be slave, the slave will be master. It is central to the gospel of Jesus, God, Jesus Christ. You can almost hear Jesus saying, the kingdom of God is a foreign woman teaching the son of God about mercy. Mark Davis writes, I wonder if it means that the crowd, well, after this, then Jesus continues, goes out into the uh, region of Tyre and Sidon, and many people came and asked to be healed. And after they were healed, they glorified the God of Israel, it says in verse 31. It's a curious way of putting it because to Matthew's audience, they would know God is God of Israel. They would, they would know that. So maybe this means that the crowds that were following Jesus had heard that he accepts foreigners, immigrants, illegal aliens, and that he will show compassion on all. Mark Davis writes, I wonder if that means that the crowd that met Jesus in the wilderness bringing their sick and lame ultimately being fed again with loaves and fish is not a crowd from the house of Israel. They are from the outside of the house of Israel. Then this encounter with the Canaanite woman really changes, really changes the scope of Jesus' ministry. Mitzi Smith, a professor at Columbia Seminary in Atlanta, writes this about the Canaanite woman. The Canaanite woman persists. Like Sojourner Truth, Rosa Parks, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, Oprah Winfrey, Senator Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and Senator, Senator Kamala Harris, the Canaanite woman persisted, but so many anonymous women like the Canaanite woman have persisted as lone minority voices among the majority of authoritative and powerful men. She persisted. She did not go away. She wouldn't be dismissed. Last week, we heard about Peter's little faith and this week, we hear about this foreign woman's great faith. In fact, this alone shows a great deal about Jesus, the gospel and faith. Peter, the one who got out of the boat because he didn't believe Jesus could be there in the midst of a storm, versus the woman who wouldn't refuse to believe. This is a difficult passage for some people, but for me, it is perhaps my favorite one in all the gospels. David Lose writes, he says, this presents a question for a lot of people. The question is, can Jesus learn? I know it may sound odd. On one hand, we might quickly answer, surely, why not? Until we worry about theological implications of the answer. If Jesus learns, a voice inside of us may ask, does that mean he's not perfect? He's not complete? 
or sinless or, and suddenly a cadre of theological police seem to be patrolling the long corridors of our imagination. What does it mean to have a flawed savior? Can Jesus be a reformed racist? If so, then can't we also be reformed? If Jesus can go from being unclean, the words of his mouth are certainly hurtful, to clean, being an agent of blessing, then we too are invited to such a transformation. And how did Jesus experience this transition? By listening to the needs of others. Are we opening our eyes and our theology and lives informed and transformed by the most unlikely of people? Who aren't we listening to? Who are we dismissing? We in the church going about business as usual may be missing the point. A savior changes his mind. He made a mistake. He blew off a woman, but he repented, which means literally to turn around. He changed his mind. That is the savior that I believe in. Let us go and do likewise. Maybe this story teaches us what it is to be holy. That maybe being holy is not being perfect and unchanging. Maybe being holy is being honest and learning and growing. Maybe what it means to be holy is to be persistent, not giving up. No, maybe even if the most revered of figures blow you off, you don't stop in the pursuit of healing and wholeness to never, never, never give up. Let us then sing about this, Patrice. Let us sing our, oh, it's not you to sing it. Sam is going to sing for us. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. At this time in our service, we normally would be passing around a uh, uh, microphone and we would be sharing some of our joys and concerns. And I have before you some of these messages that, uh, that were received. Um, it is written from, uh, Marianne wrote, love those dahlias on the communion table. It looks like Rosemary Hall has been out to her farm. 
so beautiful. And Katrina, they are so beautiful. Bonnie and Florian say, greetings to you all. We need prayers for my cousin Ethel and Gordon. Ethel has a tumor on her lung the side of, size of a golf ball, and Gordon has just had back surgery. Dean Meyer says, I have access to computer cameras with built-in microphones to fit desktop computers or laptops that do not have one. Cost is nine, uh, $59 plus tax and some shipping, depending on how we decide to purchase them. So if you would like, if you need a computer camera with a built-in microphone, please let Dean Meyer know. Kent Hall writes, prayers for the people of Beirut. Let us then bow our heads of prayer for the prayers of the people. Gracious and merciful God, we pray to you this morning, asking that you hold the world in your hands. We pray for the people of Beirut who are suffering so much after the terrible explosion. We pray for those in the world that are suffering from the pandemic, those who have lost loved ones, those who are fearful. We pray for those countries and places where it is not controlled. We pray for, in particular, where we live, the United States. For we pray for leadership to be able to be led in ways to behave as a public so that we might protect public health. And for each one of us to be conscientious in how we live and how we wear masks and with whom we associate and how we keep socially distanced, it is very difficult to do. We trust in you, gracious God. Your son, Jesus Christ, could change and learn, and so can we. We pray, gracious God, for our nation as we go through the political process. Bless us to act in good faith. And those who possibly have not participated in elections in the past to be energized and inspired to choose leadership. We ask you, gracious God, that you uh, bless, that you, that you lead all of those who are in leadership, all of those who govern us and make and execute and judge our laws. We pray, gracious God, for those on the other end, those who are imprisoned in dangerous conditions, those who have few options, in our community of Minneapolis, we pray for those who are camping out in city parks because they are homeless. And we ask that you hold them in, in your hands, that you find ways for them to find permanent housing and that you guide our leaders to find and build and create housing for those who need it. We pray, gracious God, for those who are victims of civil conflict throughout the world. We pray, pray for leaders to find ways of peace. And we pray for soldiers throughout the world, those who serve in the United States military, but also soldiers who serve in other parts of the world. For indeed, they do not make the laws. They do not set policy, but they carry it out. Keep them, gracious God. Protect them. We pray, dear Lord, for the church during this difficult time of pandemic. Help us to find ways to be together in community, socially, but not physically. It is difficult at this time to, to bring in new members, to assimilate those who are new to our community. Help us to be careful to reach out to those who are new, unknown, those who don't have internet access. Show us this new way of being in this new world in which we inhabit. We pray for our own community, for those who are losing their jobs, and for those who have found new jobs. 
We pray for the teachers among us as they face a challenge as the new school year begins. And we pray for students, those who are away from the regular way of learning for college students and graduate students who are online, high school students, but especially we pray for the little ones who are isolated and especially those who are without the resources that wealthier families have. Finally, gracious God, we pray for ourselves. Help us to keep the faith. Help us to grow and learn, to change when we need to be changed, and help us to persist, to seek wholeness and healing, even when it seems impossible. For your message makes the impossible possible. The unloved loved, the lonely accompanied. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. At this time in our service, we would then have the offertory where we pass the plate, but I can guarantee you we're not going to be doing that for a long time. We are grateful for church members who have been so faithful in their support of the church during this time. We have been able to continue um, our ministry together, and it is done um, in large part because of the generosity of members. We also have been able to give away money and support initiatives and ministries in our community. We have been able to support uh, the St. Louis Park Emergency Program, the Urban League. Um, we have sent money to the Lake Street Coalition after the destruction um, at the end of May and the beginning of June. We are continuing to be active agents of God's love, even though our building is closed. So let us now, during our offertory, hear the beautiful music. Now Thank We All Our God was written by Martin, Martin Reinhardt in 1636. He was a pastor in a German walled city at the time of the Thirty Years' War. Besieged by the Swedish army, the citizens suffered through plague, famine, and fear. One after another, the pastors in that city died until only he was left. Some days he conducted as many as 50 funerals. Reinhardt, knowing that there is no healing without thanksgiving, composed this song for the survivors, and it's been sung around the world ever since. Uh, Isaiah 12, 4 says, Give thanks to the Lord, make known what he has done. together our prayer of dedication. God of grace, we are living in a time when financially so many people are struggling and uncertain. They don't know how secure their resources are or even if they have work in the future. In this time, we are particularly grateful for generous hearts. May we use these gifts in a way that furthers your kingdom. May we be a blessing to others in this uncertain time. Amen. 
And we conclude with our closing hymn, they, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. So we conclude with the benediction, the good word. And I encourage us all to go carefully into the world. Stay at home as much as you can. But when we go out into the world, wear a mask, live safely, stay socially distanced. But even when the conditions of life make our regular social life difficult. Let us remember that we are members of a community and it is the world, not just us, it is the world that God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him, the one who changes and grows, shall participate with him in eternal love, eternal life and eternal love. So please go in peace and may the God of compassion, the Jesus of change and the power of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.